Well, hello again. I'm Dean Jones, President and CEO of Realogic Sotheby's International Realty, and this is Market Perspectives. And today we're with Matthew Gardner, my dear friend. It's been many, many years. Oh, it's been way too many years. How are you doing, Dean? Good, good. I think it's been almost three decades. Yeah, we met in the late 90s, so good grief. Long time ago. I mean, talk about how much the market has changed, how much our city has changed. Uh, I remember cocktailing at Teeny Biggs on First and Denny. You remember that building? Oh, boy, yeah. back in the days when I actually had hair. So, yes, <laughs> okay. long, a long time ago. <laughs> well, um, we have been through a ton of evolution in Seattle and our marketplace. And uh, why don't you share with our audience your pedigree and experience to give some perspective about your viewpoints? Uh, sure. Um, I've been analyzing real estate and specifically housing for close to th well, about 30 years now. Uh, originally back in the UK, um, I got my undergrad uh, at Oxford. Then I went to London School of Economics for my master's and started working for a company uh, back then that managed the portfolio of, uh, of real estate belonging to different entities, church, the royal family, various mm. people. And uh, eventually that brought me across the States back in mid 90s and uh, found my way to Seattle and thought, wow, what an interesting place. Everyone works downtown. No one lives downtown. They lived in a place called Bellevue and they got there across a bridge which sunk a couple right. of years beforehand. I said, well, who analyzes real estate? No one, quite frankly, did. And then uh, I said, okay, hang my own shingle and I'll start uh, trying to figure out the world for developers. That is where you and I came across each other back in, I think, 97. I think we were just about to break ground on our first uh, condominium high rise. And That's right. I remember um, being part of a group. We were sort of renaissance you know, folks about our revival of downtown Seattle. Mm -hmm. I mean, I come from Vancouver, BC. You came from a very metropolitan, yep. dynamic urban environment as well in the UK. Uh, boy, it's sure looking a little different today in downtown. It's changed an awful lot, hasn't it? You said, we've seen that evolution, uh, as you mentioned, starting, quite frankly, with your project with Concord. Um, grew like a weed. Until, of course, what happened in 2005, 2006, uh, the housing bubble bursting, then everything stopped again, took off again several years later. But we've actually seen a significant change, and mainly because of the construction and really revitalizing the market brought a lot of new people into downtown both apartment renters as well as homeowners as well. I mean, more apartment renters than owners. That's kind of a challenge. Aren't we like a city of majority renters now? Uh, in the city, yeah. It's about 54% renters, I think, and 36 owners. Sorry, uh, well, 46 owners. So it's fairly close, but it certainly is skewed. And a lot of that is, quite frankly, over the last several years, we really, have, as you know, we haven't built many condos. Yeah. And it's been outnumbered by apartments. Therefore, you're going to see that discrepancy occurring. Yeah. Well, and these rates haven't been helping, you know, home ownership, let's be honest. I mean, what what's your view of the Fed today and how does the Fed bank rate affect mortgage interest rates and where do you think we're going? Well, to start off with, uh, yeah, we are, we've created a lot of forced renters. Now, ones we'd like to buy, but where current rates are so significantly higher than we've seen them over the last couple of years, they just can't make it work financially. Um, as far as the Fed goes, and everyone tends to think that the Fed controls mortgage rates. They do not. Hmm. The Fed control one interest rate and one interest rate alone called the Fed funds rate. That's actually the overnight lending rate between banks. But it does have, uh, it's important because most credit cards are based on that Fed funds rate. So when we were coming out of COVID, quite frankly, uh, the economy was seeing massive inflation. One of the two jobs the Fed has, figure out inflation, get it down create price stability, as they call it. They do that by jacking up that one interest rate. And um, we saw it rise at the fastest rate we've seen since 1980. Oh, boy. So, yes, they don't control interest rates, mortgage rates directly, but we talk about the yield curve. When they raise those rates, there's a knock-on effect, certainly. And But more importantly, it was less the Fed funds rate, more the Fed, because the Fed wanted to encourage us to move through the pandemic. So they, and we did. And we did, because they wanted us to, to move. And we, what do we do when we move? We buy stuff, right? big ticket stuff. So they went on their own spending spree and they started buying 10-year treasuries, which are what mortgage rates are based upon, hmm. and mortgage-backed securities. And they didn't want to return a yield. And that, in essence, pushed the 30-year rate down to below 3%. Should not have happened, but it did. That pulled a lot of sales forward, a lot of activity. But then they moved from what they call quantitative easing, ah, printing money, spending right. it, to quantitative tightening. We're not spending anymore. Uh -oh. 
And because of that, they did that in uh, early January 2022, mortgage rates doubled in a period of eight months, literally. So you said bringing housing forward, mm -hmm. you know, are you suggesting that what would have been a natural supply and demand balance in the last couple of years was accelerated into 2021 when we really saw a lot of volumes? Yes, um, but it's not just that. It is because of COVID. Okay. And we certainly saw people moving because of the work from home situation. Oh, yes. A lot of businesses uh, found a lot of employees. So they said, okay, I can move and I can perhaps either one, find a home I can afford to buy, do that, or I can afford to pay, buy a bigger home or pay all cash for it further out if I only have to be in the office either never or, or a few days a week. So when you combine that additional demand because purely of COVID and work from home with mortgage rates, which were in essence free money, right? yeah, that's overstimulated the marketplace, not just here, but frankly across the country. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like jet fuel being added to something that was already in a pretty meteoric rise. Um, but now we have the counterbalance of that. We've had the slowest sales volumes, I mean, in several decades, Matthew. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's inescapable. I mean, all of us in the industry are reacting to mm -hmm. this new reality. Um, I had heard mortgage originators are off like 65% in mm -hmm. terms of the renewals with their licenses. And the stats are pretty sobering for real estate agents too. Um, you know, recent analysis in the US is uh, almost half of the real estate license holders uh, in the nation only did between zero and one deal uh, in the entire last year. So that's a pretty, pretty significant issue. That is sobering. What is interesting, if you think about uh, real estate brokers per se, across the country, historically, the average actually is four transactions per year. Okay. So it goes to show those that really do it as almost a part-time thing as opposed to other right. companies like yours where it is your career and you do significantly more than that. So it, yeah, it pulled back. Now, it's the biggest problem we've got. And one of the things the Fed didn't understand, it tried to create housing stability, stimulate, that all makes sense. But there was an unforeseen consequence of their actions. Hmm. And that consequence is remarkably simple. And that is the fact that a lot of people moved. Over 7 million people moved uh, in that, that one year, 2021, far more than historic averages. But they were taking advantage of those low mortgage rates. Sure. So where mortgage rates were and where people have financed, or indeed, if they didn't move, but naturally they would have refinanced their homes into those historically low rates, that's done one thing. It's created golden handcuffs. Uh, they're locked in. And they are locked in. Why would you even think about moving um, and lose the sub 3%, 30 for example, when rates are knocking around 7%? Well, you won't. And you cannot sell what's not for sale. And That's so true. again, I refinanced twice at my house and you will have to pry that mortgage from my cold dead fingers. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. Um, but therefore you can't buy what's not for sale. That means that will naturally slow all transactions for all brokerages and just nationally. However, rates are going to come down as they do. That's going to start freeing up some inventory. Now people, people are still moving, right? And they are for three reasons, job change, death, divorce. Mm -hmm. But what we're missing out on, Dean, is discretionary. The uh, the decision to move, because I want to move. I mean, it's a lifestyle proposition. I mean, there you know, you have this bounty of inventory in the United States, a lot of great places to live. And, you know, choosing how and where you live is one of the greatest advantages of being a yes. citizen in the United States. I mean, you have that ability to to roam on um, a lot of job migration, mm -hmm. you know, the relocation, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, or household formation, you know, marriage or childbirth. Um, and, you know, I would imagine that there is some percentage of pent up demand mm -hmm to move for discretionary reasons, notwithstanding being locked into their current mortgage, um, and perhaps notwithstanding the fact that they might not qualify for the next home because, you know, that that might be a more onerous underwriting. When will that pressure, that pent up demand release? Um, and what will be the catalyst for us feeling a little more new normalized in this so, housing market. So funny you say new normal, um, and, and they're pretty accurate. I believe that rates have peaked. I think they're gonna come down, okay. and they're gonna come down for the next couple of years. And I think that when we get to within about one and a half percent of where somebody's current mortgage rate is, okay. 
then I think it's less compelling to stay. You don't feel that you are locked in if you want to move. So again, it also doesn't apply to everyone. There's a lot of people still moving, all cash buyers taking money out of equities. We, S&P is knocking around 5,000 right now wow. t- this morning, which is a, a historic high. So it's, a, it's we are going to keep on see it. But I think that more importantly, the buyers we know are out there, demographically driven, absolutely. Less so millennials, we kind of tend to look at them, uh, which is true, but they're getting old. The oldest millennial is 42 this year, I believe. But it's the second half, the younger part of them, and then behind them, we've got a whole new decade of Gen Zers. And they are kids who are in college now, and the oldest ones are about to start their careers. So I think over the next decade or so, we can let, get a lot of demand from them. And on the other end of the spectrum, baby boomers. Yeah, they're they aging. aging. Yep. And at some point, they are going to sell and downsize. So I think actually from the demand perspective, I'm less worried. I'm more worried from the supply side, though. We're not building as many houses. We're not. It's too expensive to build. Yeah. Uh, and quite frankly, it's certainly in the areas that we want to be living. And a lot of that is based upon migration, as you said. Historically, it was from the center of America out. Now it's from the south to the north because of climate change. Yes. So it is becoming expensive. And not just land is expensive, certainly in markets like Washington, Oregon, California, very onerous land use policies. But uh, we've only got so much land. We've got a lot of water, a lot of mountains. And so that pushes up land prices, labor's expensive, material costs, all these things combined. Uh, do make it hard for a builder to make sense out of building a project uh, that he can sell uh, and make some money, obviously, but it's a project that people can actually afford uh, without going to yeah, the Yeah, we're, we're underbuilding is the reality. And Very we still have, so. you know, regional uh, population, job mm-hmm. growth is, mm-hmm. is strong here. I mean, that's uh, a great advantage for the Pacific Northwest in our backyard. I mean, speaking of backyards, are we going to be seeing a lot more development in our single family zonings now with uh, House Bill 1110? I think you were very active with the Yes, on that. yes. And, I, and if the audience aren't totally cognizant of what 1110 is, it in essence allows you to build uh, inside single family zoned areas, but build duplexes up to six unit buildings, depending upon demographics or, or the population uh, in that particular county. The answer to that question likely is no. Well, I've seen some increase. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say that quite simply because this is not a new situation. This actually was started back in Minneapolis back in 2016, I believe. And then the state of Oregon, Governor Brown signed it in, Newsom signed it into California, January 2022 or 23, 23, I think. Anyway, the point being is that where you are built out, as we are here in the Puget Sound, in order for it to make sense, then a builder's got to, let's say, buy a couple of houses or multiple houses, normally from different ownerships. Well, if you all know, that's like herding cats, literally. But he's buying them only for the value of the land. Yet, he's being sold the value of the land and the house that's on the land. So again, it makes it very, very hard to make it pencil financially. So will it be a panacea? Is it going to solve all our ills? No, it won't. Could it help? Well, we've seen an uptick, certainly, in duplex permits. But just because you pulled a permit doesn't mean you're going to build it. I mean, we've had that cottage zoning in some municipalities. And you can do DADUs and ADUs in the city of Seattle. And I don't know how many hundreds have been built. I mean, I, I don't think it's been many thousands. Uh, so it's not really adding a lot of inventory to the marketplace. No, on the, on the ADUs and DADUs, it's about 3,000 or so. But okay. again, the point being is that helps actually the rental market, not the ownership market. Oh. Almost most of these units are being built, which by the way, is not cheap. Uh, and then they're being rented out. Now, sensibly, if somebody was sensible, they'd, they'd have done a condo map on it so they could break it off. But the concern is a couple, well, a lot of things that should worry people. One is income, well, property taxes. How is that going to impact that? Obviously, going to raise them. Does it make sense to do it? Sure. But secondly, if I do break, split that off, how much is it going to detract from the value of what's left, the value of my home? Right. But again, it does tend to favor the uh, rental market over the ownership market. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, certainly we can get some more supply, but the demand will increase faster than the supply. And that's been historically our challenge. So, you know, median home prices are increasing. Mm -hmm. Let's look at sort of some data points. You know, you can certainly look at S&P Mm -hmm. K-Shiller. I believe the most recent report uh, through the end of last year was that Seattle, in fact, has joined the wave of other median home price increases month over month and and year over year. Mm -hmm. I think only Portland was still trailing. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And as prices are increasing, and certainly that's not a generalization, you know, because every neighborhood, every product type and price point has a microclimate, right? Um, but I want to get back to this notion of people being locked into their home mm-hmm. because of low mortgage rates and afraid to be migrating to another home um, because they'll be paying a higher mortgage rate. But if property prices are increasing um, greater than you know a point and a half a mm-hmm. year, wouldn't the rising value of the real estate investment outweigh what you were saving in a mortgage rate? Yes, you'd also have to throw in uh, income as well. And are you being paid more uh, to try and help to a degree offset that increase? But what you're saying is absolutely right. And again, we're not saying the market has hemorrhaged at all. I've been traveling around uh, the Northwest over the course of the last couple of months giving my 2024 forecasts. And at most places I go, I'm hearing the same thing, which is, yeah, you know, the uh, what they're calling them the cream puff houses, the ones that are perfect, ready, move in ready. Uh, they're still getting bidding wars on oh, them. Wow. And that is because the fact there is that shortage, certainly. People are saying, OK, yeah, I will. What they're doing is that they're hedging and they say, OK, I understand mortgage rates are higher. However, if big if, if I can still qualify, I still feel comfortable with that mortgage payment. If it's not going to keep me up at night, then OK, I'll buy because I believe rates are going to drop. And as they drop, I will then refi that loan. So and buy then refi is the strategy right now. That is correct. I mean, how many, what sort of upswell do you think is going to happen in 24 in terms of our sales volumes? You just reported we yeah. had the lowest sales volumes in decades for 23. So now we have a new year. Rates are stable, if not dropping. Mm-hmm. You know, would the savvy buyer get out ahead of this curve and start sifting through limited inventory but lower prices and less competition? What happens if they wait till the end of the year to jump on the game? Well, then they've got a couple of things. One of which, yes, rates are down, but as you mentioned, prices will be higher. Mm. That's point one. Uh, but it's going to be a, a very be interesting to see what they do. They are out there. We know, we know they're buying very limited inventory. But I think, yeah, if there's a house out there that's right for that buyer, then they're going to jump on it. And so it certainly when I say just stop, stop looking, kick back, kind of a, watch the grass grow for the summer, then start. Probably not, because you never know what you are going to be missing out on for all the reasons you just mentioned. The prices will be higher, but yeah, mortgage rates will be lower. There'll be more competition in the marketplace. Absolutely, that will be the case. But this year, you asked about how much do I expect to see uh, transactional velocities increase? Oh, I think I'd be very comfortable forecasting 10, 15 percent. Well, that's a big number. Uh, it is. It's not uh, It's not the number brokers would like to see. They'd like to see it significantly higher, sure. obviously. But for all the reasons we talked about, uh, we will see increase in inventory. But at the same time, we will see an increase in transactions because of that increase in inventory. So, yeah, I think 10 to 15 percent is about right. And that's roughly in line with uh, my friend Lawrence Young, at chief economist mm-hmm. of the National Association of Realtors. Uh, he seems to be thinking around that number nationally as well. I mean, it's less than it's regressed um, in 23. I mean, I think we are maybe migrating from, you know, FOMI, which is fear of mortgage interest, into <laughs> FOMO, fear of missing out. And I think all we're going to need is to see a few more headlines after a few more quarters. And the great unwashed might say, hey, I better jump in this game because what's the likelihood you think that waiting around is going to deliver more selection and lower prices? Oh, lower prices, no. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think for uh, three is interesting. When we saw those mortgage rates spiral upwards, there were a lot of people on the side saying, oh, this is going to be great. I'm not going to buy now because I believe we'll see a tsunami of foreclosures in the same way hmm. that people thought that was going to be the case with, with the forbearance program, right. which was a brilliant program, by the way, where you, yeah. you could uh, not pay your mortgage and you wouldn't be foreclosed on. But at the end of the day, you have to make the bank right by refinancing, paying them back what you owe. You know, one in 10 homes was in that program within six weeks of it starting uh, in early 2020. Today, it's 0.6%. So it, it did work. Why do I say that? Well, today, when we saw those rates spi- skyrocket, as far as mortgage rates were concerned, people thought the same thing. Well, everyone's, well, they'll be back in 2006. Everyone's going to hand the keys back into the bank. No, they're not, because back in 2006, we were remarkably underqualified that's right uh, to buy and um, we had these bizarre weird mortgage products there's no down payments and here in king county today about 60 percent of homeowners with a mortgage have got more than 50 percent equity we are in a very good situation so, and it is very hard to qualify 
I suppose it's very easy. So even though rates rose, people are saying, okay, well, uh, that's fine by me. I mean, there's really no distress is what you're saying. Absolutely So not. waiting for some, you know, shoe to drop in the housing market, yeah. you're, you're, not, you're not waiting around for that. No, you're not. And he said, if you think that, okay, if you do believe there's going to be, let's say, a recession, um, which I don't, but if, if you do that, then some people might think that's great. Recessions mean that home values go down, and they'd actually be wrong about that. That's only ever happened twice in history. Uh, through, if you do have a recession, um, home prices actually go up. Fairly modestly, still got, or they remain flat. They rarely go down. Now, they did 2007 because housing hmm. caused the recession in the first place. Well, how do you like your porridge? Let's talk about Goldilocks economy. Yeah. Uh, you know, are we too hot? Are we too cold? Are we just right? I mean, are we in a recession? Mm. Are we getting a soft landing? I mean, kind of map out the next few quarters for us and sure. feel free to sprinkle a little politics in that too. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Um, <laughs> so uh, here we go. When the Fed started raising rates to save off inflation, then the market immediately said, we're going to have a recession. Now, why do they jump out so quickly and say that? Well, if you look, history is a great forecaster. They think of the future. Mm -hmm. And every time the Fed has had an aggressive rate increase with the goal of slowing the economy down into that soft landing, right. well, they're pretty lousy at it. They've only got it right twice in history. Hmm. Every other time, we've had a recession. So general consensus was we are going to have a recession. Uh, I didn't quite see it that way. And what we have seen is the economy slow down. Wage growth, which we peaked at over 7%, starting to roll over. Inflation coming down. Uh, PC, another index which the Fed looks at very closely, personal consumption expenditures. Uh, that on the top line number is 2.6. It's it, half a point away from that, that 2% that they want. I'm adding jobs still. So no recession. The, uh, the economy has actually proven to be remarkably resilient. Now look at the stock market. In the stock market right now, we are seeing, certainly seeing most recently, uh, credit card delinquency rates are starting to rise. Oh. So that is happening. But what I would, uh, I would suggest is, I believe, and always have done, that we will ha they will achieve that soft landing for the third time in history. Okay. Uh, I mean, way to go, Fed. Uh, but uh, we won't see a, a recession. Now, there are still some pessimists out there. I mean, you know what they say about economists, right? We, we've forecast 12 out of the last six recessions. Um, <laughs> you always get it wrong that way. Uh, even those that are still thinking that's going to be the case, they're looking at a annualized drop of maybe half a percent uh, in Q2 and Q3 of this year. Um, that, if that's the case, then it will not feel like 2007, that recession, which was heinous, as we all know. It won't feel like 2001. Around here, the dot-com or dot-bomb yes, recession. Yes, dot-bomb, I was there. It was horrendous, as was I. Terrible. I feel a lot like the early 90s recession, which, to be totally honest with you, for a majority of the public, they said, well, we had a recession. No one told me. Right. Uh, because you didn't feel it at all. So I think they'll get achieve that soft landing. Um, what's going to be important, however, is when they start reducing rates. If they wait too long, uh, close we get to the fall, that will certainly raise the potential uh, of a recession. Because historically, they end up raise, uh, keeping rates too low for too long and then raising rates too late and keeping them too high for too long. So I think if they, as long as they don't do that, and I don't think they will, mainly because guess what happens in November? An election. It's an election. But these job, these job uh, stats are coming in pretty hot. And, you know, inflation seems like it's under control, right? Yeah. And, but job growth in the economy still seems like it's pretty hot. No, and, and it is. And now everyone, of course, is looking at the, the January number. Um, right. uh, north of 300,000 jobs. My forecast was 180. So it, was, it blew out. Uh, and what happened then? Well, we saw a sp spike in mortgage rates. Right. Um, because all of a sudden, bonds went, uh-oh, this is not good. And so we saw bond yields rise. A um, couple of nuances about that. Uh, the numbers, actually, they, once a year, they adjust for seasonality. So that seasonal adjustment kicked in hmm. uh, in January, which is why we saw a huge number and actually upward revisions in the prior two months. That hopefully will come out in the wash uh, as we go through the spring. Because mm. a lot of uh, business owners I'm talking to, they are seeing an election coming up and they're just conscious that they slow down in the economy, which they know certainly the Fed wants. So rather than hire more, well, they're saying, yeah, no, I'm just going to make my staff work harder yeah. rather than have them out. So I do expect to see it drop down uh, probably on a monthly average, below 100,000 jobs per month, uh, slightly starting probably late spring. And that, if we do that, then I'll be happy to see that occurring. 
Although if you're doing less than 100,000 jobs, that means the, uh, the unemployment rate has to rise because we're creating, the labor force is growing, growing by that much. But even then, it'll rise up to 4.2, 4.3%, maybe. Mm. Not terrible. So again, that Goldilocks that you talked about, yes, there's a few things which are still bullish out there, certainly. Wages this year will be up by probably 5%, more than you'd expect to see, more yeah. than normal, but better than it was or lower than it was uh, the prior year. So I really think that soft landing, there, there'll be some bumps along the way as we go into the fall, the economy will be put on pause kind of what happens just before an election, sure. just until we know who's going to be in the White House. Yeah, I, I would imagine if I'm trying to get elected and I have any ability to influence the headlines, I'd want to see us, you know, uh, touch through some tougher times, but then start on the incline where maybe everyone's feeling a little bit better about the economy and the prognosis. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of geopolitical concerns that are beyond our control. Um, they do have an impact on the consumer psyche. And, you know, I think there's a lot of folks that are waking up through the big dark that we had seasonality here in mm. the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, historically, we have the lowest sales volumes of the year, yeah. you know, from November through um, middle of February. Mm -hmm. So there must be a lot of decisions going on right now around the dinner table about where we're going to be this spring. Um, you know, I understand spring is coming early uh, as of Groundhog Day. Uh, so yeah. Phil saw his shadow. <laughs> yeah. um, so what what's the environment that you think should be part of the conversation for those entering the housing market on a purchase this spring? Yeah. Fascinating enough, uh, yesterday, uh, Fannie Mae, they do a, a monthly survey, a very interesting one you know, of consumers. That, uh, and what I, I read it, uh, and it was remarkable for two reasons. One, people's comfort level with their own jobs was mm -hmm. at an all-time high. I mean, they were, yeah, doing great, not worried about being laid off, believe my income's going to go up. Lots of jobs out there. That's a, like, okay, I feel fine. But secondly, the share uh, of the population that believed that mortgage rates would be dropping over the next year was at a high that the survey hasn't seen. The survey started in 2010. So it, it's a reasonable length of time. And that we've never seen uh, that actually to the, the degree that it came out this last month. It was a January report. So comfortable with your job. Believe mortgage rates are going to come down. Actually, a majority of people do believe that is going to be the mm -hmm. case. That is certainly conducive to people saying, And oh, prices are rising. Yeah. Now is the time I really should start looking or engage a broker, really start that if it makes sense uh, for me to do so, uh, depending on where we're looking in the country or if we are staying local. So I think we're going to find buyers out there. There's no doubt. Naturally, the big thing is going to be is how many sellers are there going to be? But we've still, as I said earlier, we're still seeing a, a lot of competition for homes that are priced right, move-in ready. Yeah. Uh, they are not hanging around on the market. In fact, most market areas, I like to go back to 2019, last normal year, you could argue that we had. Um, and uh, in De just like to say December, uh, most markets, the average length of time a home stayed on the market was lower in, in December of 2023 than it was in December of 2019. Interesting. Well, there is less supply. I mean, I know of some transactions, and this is going to surprise our audience, but, you know, under $2 million in a good school district uh, on the east side, um, uh, open house weekend, um, you know, a very beautiful home. Uh, over a hundred tours. Now, certainly there's some neighbors uh, kicking tires, Lucky but lose, sure. you know, multiple offers, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously a successful transaction in the making there, but we're hearing about that more and more. Um, and if that's any indication about the pent up demand mm -hmm. that's waiting to unlock and enter the market um, and, and just repackaging what you just shared with me is there's great consumer confidence the the ability of to understand mortgage interest rates are coming down so that sort of buy then refi mm. idea yep. um, so it's almost like a two-step transaction go ahead and secure the home because the uh, the forever value of a lower strike price and less competition mm -hmm. uh, to get the home you want um, is a enduring benefit a temporary infliction of a higher mortgage interest rate is a temporary yeah yeah the, issue. the, the old adage goes marry the house you date the rate yeah uh, and that's what people have been saying and there's one more thing to come into that uh, which i think is interesting uh, it's always like game theory mm. the, the prisoner's dilemma um, we're getting kind of into kind of uh, big math stuff but and that is the fact that yeah people might want to move but are they going to list their home for sale if they don't believe they can find somewhere they want to buy 
And so you can't, they always get stuck in that kind of weird paradigm. And that's, no, it's not just the rate. Let's say they want, they, I want to move. Um, I don't care where mortgage rates are, but if they don't think they can find somewhere to buy, that's going to act as a disincentive to them listing. So it says a lot of other parts come into this equation as well. But ultimately, as you very adroitly put, yeah, I, I think waiting uh, for rates to come down, but you know, the offset will be prices will be going up. And more competition. And, and um, by the way, you still have to get an accepted offer. And we have seen some success with some motivated sellers to go ahead and accept a contingent home purchase, meaning that, yes, you are my buyer. We will give you some time on closing. We understand you have a home to sell mm -hmm. before you can complete buying mm -hmm. the home that we would like to sell right. to you. Um, that it's requires great cooperation. Oh, sure. But it's a great way around the issue that I just brought up. So, yeah, smart. But you still have to be the chosen buyer yes. in a contingent home purchase. Yeah. And, you know, when there's multiple offers, um, are you going to be the chosen buyer? Probably not, right? Because that's got a contingency. Yeah. There's likelihood that that might not conclude right. in a successful sale. I bring that up because we are seeing still willingness from motivated sellers that might have had a couple price adjustments and have gone through the melees of the last year mm -hmm. and they're motivated. Mm -hmm. And so this is a good time to be a buyer. We might, in fact, I would suggest be in the best buyer market that we have seen for a decade. And the reason I say that is because we know the supply will be constrained. We know that mortgage rates are likely to lower. We know that prices are going up and we know there's more players entering the field. So I say that in context to what's likely to you know, come in our future. Um, but you know, for the last couple of years, there might have been some hesitancy to be mm -hmm. a buyer because you know, prices were correcting, mm -hmm. um, especially in some markets and product types, um, in city to be exact. Right. Right. Um, and you know, we didn't know the future of Fed policies. I mean, it was a pretty scary ride to watch <laughs> what mortgage rates for some folks have tripled. Yeah, they have. Uh, it's uh, at least those ones are out there in the market to buy. And obviously that hits first time buyers more than anyone else. But those people that own their homes, you watch rates rise, they don't care, right? Because they're, they're, their rate is set. But yeah, no, it really was. And there were some people saying, okay, we're going to go back to the 1980s, which no, October 82 mortgage rates were at 18% plus points, 20%. Hmm. And some really thought that we were going that way, but that was never going to happen. Um, but there was that, that, that scare factor out there in a similar way to a degree that we saw starting in 2008, 2007. And all of a sudden we saw a wave of foreclosures, people walking away from their homes. And it was a scary period. It was, that was a long period. That was 2008 through 2000. 10, 2011, depending on where you were. Well, I had a front uh, row seat for that. And oh, you know, yeah. certainly where we saw high demand and high supply in the in-city markets, yeah. right? You know, you look at in-city condominiums, for example. Um, but after that financial crisis and after really the rug was pulled out of the, the demand side um, and, you know, mortgage lending, the whole industry was uh, in upheaval and it was very difficult to qualify because yes. the, the rules, the guardrails were changing on how to get a mortgage. I mean, thank you, Barney Frank. Yeah, it's a, the, the world changed. And again, what we have seen, obviously, when we had that massive refi boom right. and transactions. So obviously now a huge, th tens of thousands of people in the mortgage industry, they got laid off. Although I will tell you one thing, if there are any mortgage uh, people out there, and that is I really believe that 2025, 2026, we're going to see a massive demand in the refi market. Well, once and, those rates come down. And that's exactly um, why. Those people you know. say, I'll take the rate today, all right? But they are going to come down. Then I, the house that I did end up buying in 2024, I'll refinance it into a better rate. So I think that world is going to change dramatically in about another 18 months or so. So to take what you just said, if we wanted to go ahead and jump into a transaction mm -hmm. today, you know you're going to refi mm -hmm. in, let's say, 25. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're really looking at, what, 18 or 24 months of a slightly inflated mortgage interest rate. So that equates to a certain dollar amount, of course. which you get some tax benefits on. Um, but also, the value of that home could multiply much greater than that. Oh, sure. And yeah. that's the math. That's the simple math of saying why buy then refi and why not be a more advantaged buyer today when there's fewer 
um, competitors. Um, there might be less selection today, mm -hmm. but you might garner better terms, back to my uh, earlier comment about contingent home purchase. Um, but uh, will there be a flood of inventory in any product type or price point that's going to be on uh, the multiple listing service or other platforms? No, no not a flood. I, I just don't see it happening. In fact, if you look at where the market is today and even adjusting for seasonality, which I like to do with, with mm -hmm. listing inventory, uh, we're at listing level now, which is as low, well below the long-term average, going back to 1990. So it would have to, I don't see what would be the genesis for everyone to say tomorrow, I'm going to sell my house. So I think it's going to be tighter, for, which is actually supportive of home values. Right. So, but uh, to get back to that long-term average, it would take a lot. Uh, we'd have to see a lot more new construction. We're certainly not seeing that, and it's also very expensive. And because uh, I just don't see the risk, I don't see why we would see an oversupply. Are banks going to be putting a whole bunch of homes to the market? Well, that would require foreclosure. They don't have any. They don't, nor will we, because of you know, credit quality. I mean, quite frankly, yes, we'll see uh, projects or, or people that are in distress, okay, and maybe they have to go into foreclosure, okay, or, or at least they, they, they might be heading down that road. But here's what they will do. They will sell before they'll go into foreclosure. Right. Because for a majority of them, guess what? They've got equity in yes, the home. They do. Uh, unlike 2005, where people were borrowing 105% of the purchase price, which was very common back then. So they'll say, yeah, okay, it's a problem. I got to sell. Um, I don't want to go through foreclosure. Uh, I will just, I'll sell my home. So again, we're not going to see a huge uptick in that. And that back then, again, trying to equate it to that period, terrible period, before the housing bubble burst, uh, it was the share of arms, just where it mortgages. And that's what really hit that world. Yet the share of arms honey has gone up, but it's not anything like to the extent that we saw back in uh, the early 2000s. So oversupply, no. I just don't see any reason at all um, why the market anywhere, quite well, frankly. Well, then the builders that. should be doing their public service and delivering more housing. Ah, uh, yes, they should. Um, and they're not. And they would love to. Builders have been put on this planet, uh, as your family knows, to do one thing, and that's build shelter, build housing. Mm -hmm. They know that demand's out there. They'd love to meet it. But what they're figuring out now is, well, they have to have some skin in the game. I mean, back in the early 2000s, you could borrow a, almost the entire cost to develop a project. Right, capital stack. Yeah, and now, now you're lucky if you can borrow 62, 63% of total cost, you've got to have skin in the game. So they're looking at the cost, um, and they're also looking at what it will cost them to build, and that end product, okay, it's a great house, but if that house is priced twice what the market is prepared to pay, will they build it? No, they won't. Well, and, you know, one of our prior guests, Kevin Wallace, um, who does some uh, for rent construction, you know, argued that it's really tough to time the market as a for sale product offering because you have to pick the one moment when you can maximize the value on your investment, whereas in a rental capacity, you know, you can hang on and you can kind of weather the storm, mm -hmm. the peaks and troughs of the market cycles because um, you have a, an annuity, a long-term asset that's usually improving in value. So I, the reality yeah. is the for rent market development is <laughs> drastically exceeding the for sale. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, up until recently, we were under construction in America on over a million apartment units. That's a record we've never seen before. And I think last month we were down about 990,000. Again, record number of apartments. But Kevin, uh, Kevin Smart guy, and I know him and his father very well, um, yeah, good people, but it is time in the market, it is hard. But you also have to look at it based upon the predictability. And that is, okay, I've made an application uh, to build something. Uh, one, is it gonna go through? Two, how long is it gonna take? Because for most builders, they've tied up that land. That, that, that uh, financial clock is already ticking. Right. It takes too long because uh, DPD, uh, the planning agencies aren't doing things quick enough. That just is added pressure on pricing. It's so all going to be passed to the consumer at the end exactly, of the day. That is exactly right. And then they throw on other regulations and, you know, taxation for builders. I mean, I understand that they, they see that, you know, in some municipalities as a way to generate um, revenue for operating 
these cities. Um, but if you overtax and create too many guardrails on developers and, you know, policy mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. growth management, mm -hmm. you know, you look at Puget Sound Regional Council and some of their estimates and where we're needing to be in the next 25 years, we're nowhere, oh, no. nowhere I mean, it, near uh, delivering the housing that's necessary for the population growth. I was having a, a conversation actually with, with some people yesterday about that. And the uh, uh, Commerce Department put out a number recently that in, between now and 2014, 18 years, they believe that we'll have demand for 1.1 million, million new housing shelter units. So that is across the spectrum. Like ownership, that's rental, that's low income, that's market? a whole, the state of Washington. Wow. 1.1 million. That would require one. We'd have to see the number of households go up by 30% in that period of time, um, which I, I, I wonder. Two, it require construction of more units than has ever been built uh, in Washington state. Again, I question that as well. So they're throwing out some very, very heady numbers. Um, I would say, does that account for the 147,000 unit deficit, which they believe that we have already in the state? So yeah, I mean, th there's a big, grandiose plan. I just don't see one will where, huh, quite frankly, where those homes will be built. Or if it's going to be that Well, much. the missing middle, right? I well, mean yeah, exactly. But if they, how, you know, half, half of the state's population lives in the tri-county area. Right. 51% uh, of the state's housing units are in the three county area. So what about the other 36 counties that there are out there? Uh, it's, so it's growth management, yeah, yeah, it's there, we all know. Uh, created in 1990, ratified by all 39 counties in 1993, mm -hmm. says where you could, where you could not build. There's no political will to expand those boundaries. We know that. So we need to look at the land within those boundaries. And Higher how, density. Are we best utilizing it? And, and quite frankly, uh, residential zoning in America uh, was created back in 1925. And it was created to be one thing, exclusionary. Right. And that was the goal. So that means, let's say Seattle, it's always the one we pick on, right? Because that's where we are. A, 73, 74% of the residentially zoned land in the city, Northgate to South Center, is zoned single family. And what planet does that ever make sense? Well, it's changing in a lot of cities, um, obviously, higher density and rezoning or upzoning, as they call it. But, you know, I think if it, knowing all that, Matthew, mm -hmm. where's the opportunity to enter into home ownership that you feel confident is a concrete investment? Funny you say the word concrete. Uh, I think it's certainly no downtown Seattle has been hit hard. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm quietly confident that the uh, the change in the makeup of city council um, is going to be beneficial to the city itself. And I think that means that where we might have overcorrected on the downside on values, that could turn around. But if the urban world is not for you, then I would look out at ex-urban markets. I think there's some, a number of years ago, I called out Burien uh, and that went skyrocketing after that. So I, I think you can look at those periphery markets. We've seen it happen already. Um, Lake Forest Park, Mount Lake Terrace, a, a couple of local ones. I was seeing massive gentrification. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's to the point of us, back in the early days of COVID, and uh, mentioned earlier, everyone thought we we're gonna to move to Yakima. No, that was not gonna happen. Uh, but we did see a resurrection in ex-urban and really some suburban markets. And that is where you could see that because as you mentioned, the missing middle, maybe we'll talk about that in a second. People want to be almost one foot in and one foot out, uh, close enough to the urban core if they've got to be there for work. Sure. They are working part-time. Yeah, hybrid office. work weeks. Exactly. Uh, so it's yet far enough away that they, they can hopefully afford to buy somewhere. So I think some of the markets which had been overlooked uh, because people kind of look down their nose at them um, over the course of the last two decades, yeah, um, that's now, they're ones that are now getting people just looking around saying, huh, I think it's going to start changing. Well, there's a there there, um, this proverbial boom burb, right? So it's a suburb that became its own booming main street that has, you know, the lifestyle attributes, you know, and really they're not uh, suffering the leak of demands that you would see in a true suburban community that, you know, you would have to drive to certain amenities, yeah. right? Um, but now these more walkable ex-urban mm. locales are seeing, um, as you mentioned, the gentrification, mm -hmm. the new product lines, mm -hmm. and they're becoming very, very livable um, and really uh, relaxing the need to go to a major metro area for anything. Oh, yeah, and you're actually right. I happen to be a, uh, speaking of an event in, in Edmonds uh, a couple of days beautiful. ago. Beautiful, Edmonds is and It's beautiful. gorgeous, walking around downtown there. Yeah. Yes, it's waterfront. Unfortunately, not that cheap there because of that. Uh, but we are seeing those, those nodes and they are looking 
around what's going on in their world. They want to keep that life. They, they don't want to change it. They're happy with what they've got and they're very protective of it. Well, it's an island you can drive to a little bit like West Seattle exactly. and some of these little golden nuggets mm. of communities that feel very bespoke to themselves, but right. have had seen pretty significant increases in demand. Um, and, you know, and then looking across the water or across the mountain range, mm -hmm. I mean, what about Kitsap, Pyrrhus and Snohomish and Kittitas counties that these are all surrounding King County, mm -hmm. which we could all agree is not going to meet the housing demand, especially for the missing middle and more attainable price points. So are we going to, you know, float, fly or drive to affordability? Um, how will that impact? What are some of your favorite markets to watch? Mm -hmm. Uh, and you've noted a lot of them, and, and you're absolutely right. Historically speaking, uh, most of the jobs we know are in King County, fine. And if somebody could afford to live in King County, they did. If they couldn't, however, it was that drive to buy. Mm. It, it was the term that was used. And they used to, back in the day, up until about 2018, jump in their cars, head north into Snohomish County. Yeah. And then commute Marysville south. had a boom. Absolutely. Marysville, uh, Lake, Lake Stevens, mm -hmm. another one. Um, then what happened was all of a sudden people jumped in their cars. And they weren't driving north anymore. They were driving south mm. into Pierce County. Why? Uh, what the one hundred thousand dollar delta in median home values between Snohomish and Pierce? Right. All of a sudden Snohomish became unaffordable, and so then they were heading south. Kitsap County, and I've always been a fan of it. They actually have been doing some construction there over the years. Uh, yes, ferry to get to it. There's that boat, boat there. Foot ferry. I mean, they got fast ferries uh, now. Oh well, okay. So you could Kitsap County in two ways. One, you look at it North County. So obviously Bainbridge Island, then out there beyond that, Portsmouth, Silverdale, Port Orchard, or then you look at the south part of Kitsap into Bremerton, which is where yes, the passenger only ferry. People want me to be really excited about Bremerton uh, and that market, especially because it's now a half hour ferry ride, not a one hour one yes. on the passenger ferry. And I kind of am, but it always breaks down. Uh, if they could actually get that ferry uh, to actually not break down every other day, I, I would be a lot happier. Right. <laughs> so, and, and I'm sure that they will. So I really think the kits up, yeah, right now it's kind of separated. Um, but Pierce, yes, the Homish, yes. Now, some say, well, okay, how about further north? Maybe up into Skagit. That's just too far. Even if you're if coming commuting. to work. Yeah, if yeah. you're only coming to work a couple of days a week. And don't get, I, I love that, the Tulip Festival. It's a right. very cool places uh, up there. But if you are, even if you're doing it a couple of days a week uh, commuting, that's just not going to work. And then beyond that, obviously, Whatcom County, and that's going to be very insular, isolated, deep water port, but very reliant on Canada. I mean, I got to tell you, there is a different way to look at this. I mean, you are in a very expensive market, like Medina, living on Lake Washington, mm. golf course communities, or, you know, you think about that lifestyle, and obviously plenty of equity has been built there. I'd have to think that most of those folks that are deciding to maybe um, live differently and, and maybe more globally and have a home somewhere else would want to harvest the equity out of a home like that, maybe buy a very similar home on American Lake in, in South Sound and have uh, a very similar home at a third of the price or live on Fox Island, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is another, you know, undiscovered neighborhood community or around Gig Harbor. I mean, there's some very beautiful, almost familiar like uh, enclaves in the South Sound. Oh, University that are Place, absolutely. Equidistant yeah. to SeaTac Airport or private airports or all the residential services. And you're really not giving up that much in terms of your lifestyle. And it just is maybe a migration that we'll see is is buying down in the next markets to matter and then harvesting that equity to go, you know, with other pursuits um, in sea, sand, snow, sun, or surf destinations. Right, and, and, and you are absolutely right, of course. And that's what I'm saying. I think that we're gonna see that, that periphery, and again, those counties adjacent or to, to King County, uh, will continue to expand. Mm -hmm. Now, and that, that would not surprise me at all, because again, you can, if you're coming out of Mercer Island, Hunts Point, Medina, Yarrow Bay, wherever that may be, you're going to come out there with a lot of money, yeah. and we know it. And certainly you can get a lot more bang for the buck. And it's to a degree, if you scale that back a bit, it's what we saw uh, through COVID of people selling on Capitol Hill, uh, these, these kind of markets, and they're the ones that bought in Mount Lake Terrace, paying all cash right. for those homes, harvesting the equity, and that's why we've seen that gentrification in these on the on the cut periphery between King and Snohomish counties. So that has happened in a smaller way, certainly smaller numbers than we're looking at. But yeah, I mean, Gig, Gig Harbor University Place, but if, uh, there's a, a bunch of wonderful areas, both south, north, and indeed west in Kitsap County that people do want to be in. And they, they're not leaving the Puget Sound. 
And that is, I think, a fascinating thing, and especially for our, our all older homeowners. Now, when the presumption always was, if they're downsizing, retiring, they're going to leave and move off to Arizona somewhere. They're not, they're staying put. And yeah, they're sort of lingering longer in their personal residence. And, you know, I think I can understand if, if it looked like the market was correcting or there was less household formation because the millennials were taking longer to get married and hmm. have children. Um, but, I mean, is it a fair assessment that, you know, in 25, hmm. in, you know, uh, a year and a half from now or so, we're going to be post-pandemic, mm-hmm. post-election, mm-hmm. post-recession, mm-hmm. hopefully post-war. I mean, let's paint the picture for where we may be as a society. Do you see a, a roaring 20s, you know, where history repeats itself, you know, 100 years after the Spanish flu pandemic right. and capital's things. cheaper again, and maybe there's a societal reawakening of, of wanting to be back in an urban environment. And, you know, that was the invention of social clubs and yeah, you yes, know, all was. kinds of things that um, kind of feels like we hit the reset button and maybe maybe we'll get through it. I, I, one, we will get through it. Okay. Uh, regardless, the sun will always come up tomorrow. That's just the way it works. But, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously you go back to then, not only had World War One. I mean, the Great War, uh, then of course uh, the pandemic that we had. Yes, it was it was the genesis of the twenties. Um, on one hand, that was remarkably good. On the other hand, it, it wasn't. It obviously led the initial reaction towards uh, the Second World War. But sure. not going to go down that road. But uh, my point being is that, yeah, I think we could. And the reason being is that, even though hopefully we will not see a recession, but we will see a. a we, a slowdown in the economy. Every time you have a recession, it's almost a reset for the US economy. What happens is you have that recession, whether it be a big one, a small one, but then that, that timer is reset. And then normally you have approximately seven to nine years worth of growth because you have recessions because the economy uh, is cyclical, uh, cyclical in essence. Sure. So um, uh, what it means is that we can have that. And of course, businesses work in cycles. We'll have that maybe seven, eight, maybe nine years of growth before the next recession. That's kind of what we've seen, quite frankly, for 200 years. So it's not likely to change. And that means we'll be at the start of that potential period of growth. Are there issues out there that could uh, not stall it, slow it down? Yeah, sure. Uh, certainly what's happening globally uh, is going on. I, I watch very closely, certainly, what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, what's going on uh, with uh, Iran's participation in, in, in uh, Syria, uh, and that's sure what's going on in, in Israel and Palestine right. so, uh, and the Red Sea. So there, there are a lot of moving parts to it. However, I'm fairly hopeful that we'll get through that period in the next well, 12 months, hopefully. And then yeah. through the election, now well, then let's see who's uh, uh, who's in residence of the White House. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I really think the future going through certainly the balance of the uh, the 2020s into 2030, I think uh, the likelihood is it's going to be more positive than it will be negative. Well, that's a great way to, to wrap up because, you know, as we look back on history and we look at our trajectory uh, forward, you know, we have all these influences with mortgage rates are up and down and, of course, economic cycles up and down. And, you know, we have presidential elections mm-hmm. and we have geopolitical concerns and we have demographics. And I mean, there's all these different mm-hmm. um, considerations. But the one poly that you can fly through fairly reliably mm-hmm. is median home prices mm-hmm. of real estate for residential properties. And it just occurs to me that despite all those you know ups and downs that you know the the home purchase price is a golden ticket to equity gains and it doesn't seem like there's much likelihood that by waiting there's going to be uh, a lower price in your future yeah and, and you're right i mean i i i got data going back to 1890 uh, and it demonstrates that home prices in the country in essence got by inflation but they go up We've only had two systemic periods of declines. We know the housing bubble bursting. There's another one back in the very early 90s, but that's it. But as you said, yes. And what's fascinating is the Federal Reserve does a great study uh, every three years, which looks at the median household wealth of a homeowner household mm. relative to a renter household uh, in the country. And their latest numbers were actually published a month or so ago. Median household wealth of a homeowner household in America today is about $360,000. Median household wealth of a renter household in America, $11,000. Hmm. Yes, to your point, it's where a vast majority of Americans create their wealth. It's also uh, home ownership means that, guess what? You can paint your walls yeah. uh, and that's okay. It's, liberty. It's also forced savings. 
because through the first decade, let's say, of an ownership of a house, yes, a majority of your payments every month are to the interest, but a little little amount is to principal. Sure. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think it really is. It's not for everyone. We know that in America, 65% of us own 35% rent. Been that way since 1965. But although I think that that is actually going to go up closer to 70 in the next decade yeah. or so. But it really is. Um, the financial advantages, the lifestyle advantages, uh, the ability for your children, uh, uh, better, not better education, uh, more stable uh, for homeowners than it is for, for home renters. All of those boxes are ticked. Yeah. And so is it for everyone? No. But for those that it is, absolutely it's a way to create wealth. Um, and it's also a great place to sleep at night. Yeah, it sure is. Well, I mean, well said, and I just reflect back on those um, trend lines, and it occurs to me that the the highs are always higher and the lows are mm -hmm. always higher, and the general trajectory is still for gains. It doesn't yeah. seem like there's any imminent reasons nope. to um, pull back from leaning into your future, and yeah. um, you know, you've done a great job at, at helping us understand where we are and we were, where we might be going, Matthew. So. Until next time. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation. I my appreciate friend, I mean, you. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate you. And I cannot believe it's been almost 30 years. Three right? decades. We should have just bought a bunch of real estate back then. Woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? <laughs> so good All to right, see brother, you. All right, brother, you too. Well, thank you, Matthew Gardner. And until next time, this is Market Perspectives. Please follow us on social media, leave a comment, and we will see you next time.